Good morning and welcome to High Point Church. We're so glad to have you here on this Palm Sunday as we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem with people waving palm branches. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, of course, we know the end of the story. It be starts with Jesus' death and then resurrection on Sunday, which we celebrate um, the gift of eternal life that Jesus paid the price for us to have. I would hope and encourage you to spend the week in the Gospels this week just really understanding the love of God that he has for you, that he would die for you. That is our desire here at High Point Church, that you know the love of God. And so uh, we connect with you in a million different ways. First off, your staff has worked so hard to create a service this Sunday so that you would connect with our loving God. We also have connect cards. This is a place for you where you can write down any prayer requests or needs you have. You have to know that your staff here at High Point Church is praying for your needs all throughout the week. If this is your first time visiting with us, we'd love to know how to connect with you with your phone number and your email address so you can get on our email list. If this is your first time, welcome. We have a gift for you at the uh, welcome table, so I encourage you to go out and get that. Another thing I'd encourage you to do is take a picture of that QR code that's on the back of your seat. That will tell you about all the great things that we have going on here at High Point Church. Again, things that your staff and volunteers are working hard to create so that you can connect with the people of God as you walk in your faith journey. One thing that's going on this week is our Good Friday service. We hope that you'll come. And again, as we remember Jesus' death and resurrection so that we can have eternal life. Let's pray. God Almighty, you are so good. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you. I pray you'll clear our minds and clear our thoughts so we can truly connect with you. In your holy name I pray, amen. Would you stand and worship with us this morning?
Jesus reigns upon the throne. All heaven sings to Him alone. We watch and wait like a bride for a groom. Old church arise, He's coming soon. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we are here to, to worship um, and to do nothing else. Uh, pray that you will speak boldly through Kevin, that um, healing that needs to happen will happen and people will be restored um, and that it will charge us up for this week. In your son's name, amen. You can be seated. one week away from D-Day. I mean that in a good way. It is going to be a busy, busy ride uh, next week. As a matter of fact, I'm, um, I'm, I'm nervous about it. I'm just going to be gut level honest. People have been saying, what can I pray for you about? I can say, pray for Easter because I, I, I hope we have enough services. And uh, I'm, I'm going to ask each service, please, what we need next week is we need about 250 of you on Saturday 8.30 on Sunday, 10 on Sunday, and 11.30 on Sunday. That's a, that'll, that'll work. That'll work parking. That'll work kid zone. That'll work number of chairs that we own. We actually bought some additional chairs just out of concern for maybe not having enough. So please, next week, if you'll just suspend your normal, you know, kind of like routine where you walk and you get, sit in the same chair and you come to the same service and all that, you just got to break that, Okay. I, I need you going to, most likely we're going to need help at Saturday night and uh, 1130 on Sunday. If we can get those full, then we should be able to manage the others. So please uh, give some thought to that, okay? Uh, leading up to that, we have Good Friday. And we've kind of uh, maybe confused you a little bit on what time Good Friday uh, service is going to be. It's at 6 o'clock. I'm not going to say the other time that we've said before because I don't want that thought in your head. But we'll be back here this week on Friday in preparation for Sunday at 6 o'clock. I encourage you to come. I think you'll be, it'll prep us and set us up well for Sunday morning, okay? Speaking of Sunday morning, we have our Easter invite cards out there. If you've not had a chance to grab one, please uh, do that if you would and invite somebody to come. And I know I just, I, I would say that after having just said what I said before, but God will figure everything out. That's the only way I know to go into this, okay? Will you join me in prayer as we finish our last message in our money series? Father, thank you so much for the blessing of this place. Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy because of our brave men and women who serve and have served and continue to see that freedom uh, is sustained here and, and we seek for it to be in other places as well. Uh, and God, I ask that you would speak through me. I don't have a thing to say, but you have everything to say. And I pray that you would speak through me in a way that would be encouraging, challenging, healing and helping, Lord God. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, like I said, this is the last week of our uh, Money Friend or Foe series. And we're going to look at some investing this morning is what we're going to talk about. Now, Nancy and I, we are coming up on 37 years of marriage in June. And I would say for the last 30, we have been investing in preparation for retirement. We've been doing some earthly investing. And uh, a, a very common investment tool for us are called mutual funds. And mutual funds are kind of like a conglomeration of different companies that, that they pool together, and they typically are pooled together based on the amount of risk that you want to take with your investments. And so we've been mu using mutual funds over the, the 30 years um, that we've been doing this, and our hope is that we'll be prepared uh, when uh, I retire first, and then um, I wish Nancy would retire, but, but she likes what she's doing, which makes it sound like I don't like what I'm doing. I didn't mean for that to come out like that. Oops. 
Freudian slip. No, um, but we're hoping to be prepared for that. And it's something we've thought about for a long time. I'm, I'm curious, are, are you going to be prepared for your earthly retirement? Is it something that's on your radar screen? I mean, the idea is that you want to start early and then you have to have a long time horizon because you've got to ride the ups and downs. And, and that's just how that works. Um, now, the older you get, in, in my case, those ups and downs get a little scarier. But the idea is that you, um, you give yourself a lot of time and you give yourself a long time horizon. So my question, honestly, legitimately, I know this is not a financial class, but will you be prepared for that day? But believe it or not, there's another retirement that I want to talk about today that Jesus speaks a great deal about. It, it's a retirement that goes beyond our earthly retirement. It's, it's, there's an eternal retirement. And we're going to talk about this morning. And then this eternal retirement, believe it or not, you have nothing. You can do nothing. I can do nothing to get there. That's all in the work of Christ. But once we're there, what we've done here has an impact on how we enjoy once we're there. And so that's, I thought, would be an appropriate way to kind of finish this series on money, friend or foe. We're going to look at... And, and get prepared, I hope, for our retirement, retirement, our eternal retirement using God's investment strategy. And what I want to do is I want to look at four things. The first thing I want to look at is us as investors. What does that look like? How, what does it mean to be an investor of my eternal retirement? And then secondly, we're going to look at actually Jesus gives us two options, two funds, if you will, two mutual funds, if you will. And then thirdly, we're going to look at the specific investments that we can make within one of those funds. And then lastly, the question is, well, how much should I invest? So those are the four uh, points that I want to kind of dive into this idea of understanding God's investment strategy. So to do that, let's get our Bibles open to our table of contents. And we're going to look at actually look for two books in your New Testament table of contents. The first is the very first book, which is Matthew. And you'll be in Matthew chapter 6. So if you would, you're going to want to find Matthew chapter 6 and mark that. And then the second book is in 2 Corinthians, which is just a little bit further down from Matthew. And we're going to be in chapter number 9. So 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter number 9 and Matthew chapter 6. Those are the two places, if you want to mark them, that we will be flipping back and forth between. But before we do that, I want to talk about... When I say that we are going to look at investing, who's the investor? Well, that, we're the investors. But what I want us to understand is, from God's Word, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to read to you from Psalm 24, verse 1. This is what the Bible says. It says, the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants belong to the Lord. And then in Psalm 50, verse 10, it says, for every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. So the first thing we need to understand when we say we are investors, and it's not a popular thing to say, is that God owns it all. And that's hard for us to accept. Because I imagine most of you, like me, you work hard for what you earn. And so there's this sense that it's, it's mine. I've worked hard for it. I remember when my, my youngest daughter, when she graduated from getting an allowance to getting babysitting money, and then from babysitting money to getting minimum wage. And I mean, she thought she hit like the lottery, going from the allowance to minimum wage. And she came home with her first check. She was super excited. And I looked at her, I said, sweetheart, that's awesome. I go, How much of that are you going to give back to God? Well, Dad, I worked for this. <laughs> I went, you're right, you did work for it, sweetheart. I said, but let me ask you a couple questions. Who kept your heart beating while you were working? God did, Dad. Who allowed your lungs to breathe so you could work to make the money so you could have the check in your hand? God did, Dad. I mean, it's a hard lesson to learn. And may I be frankly honest with you? Some of you as adults have not learned that lesson. And it's a struggle when I'm up here talking about money. Because we hold on to it. And, and, and I'll get into why that is so tempting. 
But it is hard to accept the truth of God's word. And God says, everything is mine. Every, all aspects of your wealth, all aspects of my wealth, they are God's. And with that comes our role. What do we do with that? Well, actually, from Genesis to Revelation, Scripture is very clear what we are to do as investors of God's resources. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. This goes back to the garden. God created the garden. He sticks Adam and Eve in there. And it says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. He entrusts what he's created to Adam. He says, I want you to manage this and take care of it. And then in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 10, this is when Peter's talking about spiritual gifts. These are gifts that God gives each one of those who are followers of Jesus. And this is what, and when we are given a gift, this is what we are to do with it. Verse 10, based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others as good managers of the very grace of God. And then if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, which I had asked you to do earlier, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 11 and 12. This, the context of this letter that Paul is writing, the second letter to Corinth, is he has been asking them, he, he, he's, he's telling them about the challenges that the people in Jerusalem, God's people are having, and he's taking an offering to help them because they're really struggling. And in chapter 9, he says, I know you started and I know you're going to finish strong. And then he associates what they are doing in verse 10 and 11, or excuse me, yes, verses 11 and 12, and he says this. He says, you will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in the many acts of thanksgiving to God. In other words, your role and my role as investor of God's resources, not ours, but God's, is to do that which glorifies Him. In other words, how we spend our money can either glorify God or not. And we need to be mindful of that. And so that's, that's our understanding, albeit quickly, of what it means to be an investor. Now let's look at the two funds that we really have. And now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6 and verses 19 through 21. And we're going to look at our investment options. And there's two of them, starting with verse 19. Jesus says, don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I feel like I was just prompted by the Spirit to remind you. And I, I hope and pray you understand this. And I, and I mean it with every bit of my being. Is it's not what I want from you. It's what I want for you and what I want for myself. It's for us to really have, see money as our friend and not as our foe. And we've talked about the dangers of money. We talked about that two, two Sundays ago. And last Sunday, we talked about generosity and what it means to be generous and how money can be our friend as we generously help others. And then today, I want us to see how, how money and how we spend our money can actually set us up well for our retirement of retirements. So, so please hear me. I, I, I don't want anything from you. I, I really want everything for you. And so we, we get to this point where Jesus is now kind of talking about these investment options. And the first one he says, he, he says, don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth. And he's juxtaposing earth with eternity. And what he's really saying is, he says, I, I want you to have the right perspective here. I, I want you to invest. Remember, investing requires a long horizon. Like I said here in, in, in our economy, for the horizon, the up and downs. But he's saying it's even longer than that. He's saying, I want you to look at when you retire, retire. And I want you to build up when you're there, the treasures, not here. And so it's a command of perspective. And he's saying, don't spend your money with an earthly perspective. So he's, he's saying that the one fund option is the earth fund. Okay, the, the earth fund. Uh, again, if you're just kind of, I'm playing along with this idea of mutual funds, right? We can spend our money on the earth fund. And this is a kind of investing in which we spend money as if this is where we're going to be forever. As this, as this, this is going to be the best we can be. And as a matter of fact, we spend money like he says in verse 24, which I did not read, but it's a familiar verse I imagine to many of you. He says, no one can be a slave of two masters. Since either he will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. 
You cannot be slaves of God and money. Because it's easy for us to be slaves to money. In other words, because it's easy for us to value and cherish money above all other things, that enslaves our, our feelings, that enslaves our attitude, that enslaves our actions, our words, our thoughts, our relationships to what's best for money. And, and Jesus is commanding that we not invest that way. But why do we invest that way? Why is that so tempting? Because everyone around us is doing it. And let's be honest, I said this a few weeks ago, it is fun to spend money. Physiologically, I mean, psychologically, it just, the endorphins kind of get kicked off a little bit when, we, when we're out shopping for something new. And the danger of that is that we like that. And, and our minds are shaped by that. And unless, my friends, unless we have our minds in the word of God and around the people of God and the worship of God, so that, as Paul says, so that we can renew our minds and be transformed. Or as Jesus said, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. If we're not regularly renewing our minds in God's word, if we're not regularly staying connected to Jesus, our default mode will be the earth fund. That will just naturally be where our spending goes and where our affections and our thoughts go. Now, is Jesus saying that we can't have some collections, that we can't save for things like retirement? No, that's not what he's saying. Unless, unless it keeps you or keeps me from investing in the things that glorify and honor God. So my question is, are you spending your money with eternity in mind? And we'll get to the, the eternal fund in just a moment. But are you spending your money with eternity in mind? You might say, well, maybe I'm doing a little bit here, I'm doing a little bit there. Well, is, is that how you're spending and preparing yourself for your earthly retirement? I mean, would you be, would you be okay if your investor said, hey, how are you doing in, in making the contributions into your mutual funds and your IRAs and your 401k? How are you doing? Well, we're doing a little bit here and there. He would look at you like you are lost your mind. That will not prepare you. So, so are we going to do that for our retirement retirement? Are we, are we going to do that um, against what, what Jesus is commanding and saying, don't collect for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy? And, and why is it this, uh, we may not understand, he says, moth and rust destroy. Well, we have to understand that wealth back in the day were precious metals and fine linens. And, and what Jesus is saying, why are you pouring everything into that which is susceptible to either being destroyed or actually being taken. And, and for us today, what does that look like for us today? If we're investing if, in the earth fund, if we're investing here uh, with, a, with a, a, a very short-sighted perspective, we run the risk of all kinds of things like inflation and recession and divorce and obsolescence and tragedy. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that, that we're at risk here. And, and so, let me just finish this by saying that the earth fund, which Jesus is saying, don't spend my father's money that way because it has a very high risk and involves a very short sightedness. So what's the contrast? What's the juxtaposition? Well, he says, but collect for yourselves treasures in heaven. He's talking about the eternal fund. We got two options. We got the earth fund as investors of God's resources, or we have the eternal fund which is we are to collect for ourselves treasures in heaven. When you see heaven, when you think of heaven, I want you to think of certainly heaven is, is the place where we are prior to Jesus returning. But once Jesus returns, we're talking about the new earth in which we have, we're, we're resurrected because of what Jesus Christ has done. And when our faith and trust is in Jesus, we're resurrected and we have our new bodies and we're living on a new earth. And the question is, are you ready for that? Am I ready for that? Do we want to enjoy that to the fullest extent possible? And what I want you to notice about verse 20 is Jesus is not saying that we shouldn't think of ourselves. He's saying when you think about your retirement, retirement, he goes, collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys. 
So there's nothing wrong with thinking about and, and how we uh, invest God's money here so that we can have a, a return there. There's nothing wrong with that. He's really just trying to get us to understand and, and does not want us to invest here with an earthly perspective, without any regard for eternity. And then we can experience the treasures in heaven. Now, the, I'd love to go into this idea of eternal rewards. A lot of, lot of conversation about that. I, I, I imagine some of you are, have heard about that and, and kind of wonder, what is that? Maybe you, you've, you've heard the many crowns that we'll wear in heaven. I, I think those are metaphorical. To understand the rewards in heaven, what we're really talking about is we're talking about capacities and responsibilities. Meaning that when we, when we die and when we uh, are, are in, uh, when our spirits are with Christ in heaven and then Jesus returns and we're given our glorified bodies and now we have a physical existence on a new earth, how do we experience that? Well, in one sense, there are higher responsibilities based on how you've invested God's money here. But there's also greater capacities to enjoy what is there. Now, here's the important thing to understand. We will not be aware of other people's capacities. We'll only be aware of our own. And we will enjoy heaven to the full capacity that we have created for ourselves. And someone else who's invested in a, in a way that honors God more here, they will have a, a larger capacity to enjoy there. Let me give you a, a, an example or a metaphor, an analogy. That's what I'm looking for. About five years ago, uh, my buddy, very, my best friend, uh, took me over to Scotland to play golf, and we went to, to many of the British Open venues, and we played. And it was amazing. St. Andrews. Carnoustie. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Now, in preparation for that, I worked my golf game up big time because I wanted to go there and fully experience what that was like. I wanted to, I wanted to experience what it was like to play along the coastline when, the, when you could hear the waves crashing in and the wind was just howling. And how do you play a golf course when you have to deal with that? How do you play a, a, a golf course that has bunkers that when you get into them, you cannot see the person in them? How do you handle the, the rough that, that grows this high? I mean, how do you handle that? How, how do you understand the contours of the course and the way a, sh a hole is shaped and designed? You see, because I love golf that much and because I prepared myself, I had an, I had an amazing experience. And that's not to say I shot well every time. But had I not prepared myself, I, don't, I still would have enjoyed the trip, but I would not, I would not have enjoyed it to the extent that I did because of the preparation I did before I went. Some of you who don't play golf, you don't like golf in particular, is let's say you tagged along. You would have enjoyed the scenery and seen it, but you wouldn't have understood the contours and the shape of the holes and, and what the architect was thinking. You, you wouldn't have but you would not have known that because you had not prepared earlier for that. So you would have thought there, like, this is a, this is a great trip. And, and you would have enjoyed it to the capacity that you understood it. Versus me... And the work I prepared, I enjoyed it perfectly in a different way, in, in, a, in a greater way. But you didn't know that. It didn't take away from you. And that is what heaven's going to be like. And that is what our rewards are going to be like. So it matters. What do we do here in preparation for there? Because when we invest in the eternal fund, Jesus' promises, he says, this is where nor moth or rust can destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. We're talking about a no-risk investment, my friends, that has both an eternal return, but it also has an earthly one. And I want, to, I want you to, if you would, turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's see this, this earthly return as well. When we, when we begin to invest in this eternal fund in, in a way that God uh, glorifies and honors God, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 6. Paul says this, remember this. The person who sows sparingly means who spends sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. And then you skip down to verse 10. Now the one, being God, who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He's saying... When you invest in the eternal fund, when you are using God's resources to glorify Him, 
You're going to be blessed. There's going to be a return. And, and that return that's going to come back to you is not only going to take care of you, bread for food, but it's going to give you more to give away more so that you're building up the treasures and collecting for yourself the treasures in your retirement of retirement. That is the promise we have. That is the, the no-risk guarantee that we have. So, so there are our fund options, earth fund, eternal fund. Where do you think you are? If you looked at your money, if you looked at your spending, where's your perspective? Because Jesus closes this little section out. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. All you got to do, all I have to do is follow the money. Where your money is going beyond your needs, okay? Wherever it's going will we'll show you where your perspective is. If, if you're living for here, you're, you're missing out. So follow the money, because where your money goes, that will show you where your perspective is, all right? Now, let's, let's hopefully you hear eternal fund. That's et there's my investment tip for you this morning. Eternal fund, not the earth fund. Well, what does it mean to invest in the eternal fund? Um, it means spending your money on a couple things, actually more than a couple things, but let me give you two. The first is spending your money on your own spiritual growth, that's the first way in which we can glorify and honor God is, is that money is a great spiritual growth tool. Now, by spiritual growth, you might be thinking, okay, what does that mean? That's kind of a, a generic, general, nebulous thought. Well, that's why we talk about aim. Aiming to know Jesus to make him known. Activating our faith is the A. Impacting our world is the I. And multiplying disciples is the M. So if we spend money on growing ourselves up in activating our faith, impacting our world, and multiplying as disciples, that is a good, strong investment in eternity. And because money is such a great tool to grow spiritually because we depend on it so much, because it is in many ways the source of our security and our identity and our status, and if we begin to spend money on in building up our eternal fund to help other people, and we spend money in a way that we feel it, well, there's so many benefits to that in terms of growing spiritually. For one, we learn to trust God. We learn to trust Him. Our security is in Him, not in our bank account or our earnings potential. It is in Him. And so we, we're able to give away money, and in the process, we grow in our security of God and our trust of God. When you give money away, you realize that your, your status and your power and your, is, your, is not, or your identity is not in your status and your power. It is in Jesus as a child of God. And as you give your money away, that happens. As you give your money away, as I give my money away, we're sacrificing for other people. That's, that's shaping us into the likeness of Christ. When we give our money and spend our money um, e e on eternal matters, it keeps an eternal focus. And that's what Jesus is teaching in Matthew chapter 6. He says, guys, your perspective isn't long enough. And so money becomes this great tool that helps us to grow spiritually. But secondly, is it also helps us to grow spiritually when we're helping others. That's a great investment, is helping other people. Many verses in Scripture, and I'm not, three of them, which I'm not going to read, but let me just kind of give you the sense of them. In Matthew chapter 25, you might be familiar with this. Jesus is using this analogy of sheep and goats, and he's, he's talking about judgment. He goes, when I come, I'm separating people. You got sheep, you got goats. Do you know what he measures everyone up in making that distinction? Do you know what he measures them against? He measures them against helping the poor and the down and out. You might remember it this way when he's talking about each side and he's speaking on their behalf and they're saying, when did we feed you? When did we clothe you? And he said to them, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Jesus identified so much so with the poor. He says, when you did it to them, you did it to me. And that becomes a delineating moment. That's how important it is to help other people. Secondly, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28, Paul's getting on the guys who aren't working. And he tells them, he gives them this idea, you need to go out, you need to make money. And he doesn't say so that you can provide for your own. He says, no, you need to make money so you can help other people. And then in James chapter 2, a familiar verse or a familiar chapter where, where we talk about 
faith that's alive and faith that's dead. And Paul delineates between dead faith and real faith by what? Helping the poor. So we cannot get away, and we will never be able to get away, about how important it is that God gives us what he gives us so that we can help and glorify God in how we spend it in the eternal fund, helping other people. It is unavoidable. <clears throat> and when you give to High Point, when I give to High Point, you're helping a number of ministries. You're helping with the school backpack program uh, in which we're able to help people that are in need. You're helping on the giving tree during December when we're able to help people of need. We have a benevolence fund so that when people call us and they call us and they say, I can't make my rent, I can't make my light bill, my utility bill, we help them. We send people out on missions to help those in places that desperately need help. And so that just needs to be something that we're mindful of. I mean, when you give towards the, towards the church, you're, in a way, you're also you're helping yourself grow spiritually because it allows myself and, and our staff to be able to focus entirely on how we can build you up and grow you up. So it's a good investment. And there's, there are others, but helping people is mission critical, which brings me to the very last part of what I wanted to share with you, and that is, okay, <clears throat> how much? How, okay, I'm an investor. I got that. And I realize there's two, there's two fun options, right? There's the earth fund and the eternal fund. I, I get it. The eternal fund is where Jesus is commanding us to go. Okay, and I understand that within the eternal fund, that, that, what does that mean? That means I, I invest in my own spiritual growth. That, that's, that's really important. And I, and I invest in helping other people. Got that? How much do things? Chapter 9. <clears throat> Listen to verses 7 and 8. Paul says, Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. <clears throat> and God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. So how much are we to invest in a way that honors God? Well, I'm not going to give you an amount. I know you probably, I, me, I want an amount. And, and uh, <clears throat> I will tell you that, that Nancy and I, where, where we've landed is we've landed, we, we kind of said, all right, well, if in the, in the Old Testament, they gave 23 and a third percent. And, and part of that, 10% of that, was to go towards the Levitical priests who owned nothing. And God's people who had land, they would harvest the land and they would bring 10% of that into the temple for the Levitical priests to live on. So Nancy and I have started with 10% and we try to work our way up from that. And we know for some of you that sounds like chump change because your generosity uh, is, is greater than that and we aspire to do that and we, we need to have conversations about that. But that's all I'm going to say, but that's just for us. We're, the New Testament teaches that we're to give, as we saw last week, generously. It teaches we're to give sacrificially. There's many ways, but there's not an amount. It's always described kind of with an adverb. These are, this is how we do it. So... In this case, how, how are we to give? Well, we're to look at our hearts. Now, here's my question. Any heart? Because in Jeremiah, this is what God says about the heart. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. He says, the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? So when Paul is saying, give what you decide in your heart to give, he's talking about not about any heart. He's talking about a heart that has been changed and transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. That is the kind of heart that he speaks of. It's the kind of heart that God spoke of in Ezekiel chapter um, 36 when he was foretelling about what was coming and that was Christ and the Holy Spirit. He says to the people of God, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully Observe my ordinances. So it's not just any heart. It's not a heart of stone. It's a heart of flesh that's been changed by the love of God seen in the person of Jesus Christ. That God gave up his son and Jesus gave up his life so that we could have life. And it's in that vein of generosity that God would have us to give back and to give back cheerfully. Don't do it unless you can do it that way. You see, if, if you give reluctantly, if I give reluctantly, if, if you give just kind of out of habit, my friends, that's just religion. 
And, and that's a foul smell to God. He wants you to say, look in your heart. Do, do you sense in your heart? Have you seen in your life my love for you? Have you seen the sacrifice of Christ for you? Does it resonate with you? Give from that. Give from there. Give from that place. Give from that understanding. That is the kind of offering that honors God. It should reflect, right? Our offering should reflect that Jesus gave his life <clears throat> for us. Don't you think at the very least <clears throat> we should give to him changing our lives to do it? Don't you think we should think to ourselves, <clears throat> what, what am I going to deny myself? What am I going to sacrifice that I don't have that other people have because I want to give and I want to invest in the eternal fund? <clears throat> I, I want to I, I recognize, I want God to see that I understand what he's given up of me and I want Jesus to understand what he gave up for me and, and here I'm giving something up for him. I'm going to say it again. I don't want anything from you. I want everything for you. And money has its talons and its grips in us. And you're foolish if you don't think that's the case. We looked two weeks ago when Jesus looked at a man who, who had so much that he built a bigger barn because he just kept coming in. And he says, you're not rich toward God. He said, you fool. And, and so I, I say that humbly, my friends. But I want you to experience the life and the freedom in which you are not a slave to money, but you are a slave to God. And you see that when you have God, you have everything. But when you have money only, you have next to nothing. And your investments will reflect that as will mine. So, we're almost done with money. But understand, I, I, I prayed for this morning. I know money has an effect. I, it has an effect in my life. And it's so easy just to, to gravitate to that. You know, a few weeks ago, I talked about greed, right? And I said, no, one, no one's ever come to me, ever, ever come to me and said, Kevin, I struggle with greed. They've come to me and said, I struggle with alcoholism. I, I, I struggle with lust. I, I, I struggle with bitterness. I struggle with gossip. I, I struggle with insecurity. I, I struggle with, with doubts, fears. But never greed. Why? Well, I connected it to being rich, right? I said, because people don't think they're rich. Why don't they think they're rich? Because rich is about margin. It's, it's the fact that when we make more and more and more, our standard of living chases and catches up to what we make. And so we never have margin. So we never feel rich. And so greed lies in weight. And, and it, it influences our decisions and our thoughts and our feelings and our hearts. And it must not and the only way I know to get greed and keep it at, a, at an arm's distance from you and me is to give away and invest eternally your money and my money, which in reality is God's money. So with that in mind, let's close out this way. I'm going to challenge you this week. Would you please budget for regular investing in your eternity? Budget for it. Plan for it. Prepare for it. Because if you don't, you never will. It's like insanity. It's like doing the same thing over and over, but getting, expecting different results. It just won't happen. So budget for regular investing in attorney. Secondly, is evaluate honestly how generous you are. How generous are you? I mean, how sacrificial are you in investing in eternity? Thirdly is sell something or some things. I and mean, we're, we're coming to that season where you're going to have these community garage sales. Man, have a big garage sale and give all the proceeds away to somebody else. And then lastly, if you haven't yet, we got FPU, and there'll be a table out there. My wife will actually be at the table. Financial Peace University. It's an amazing ministry. It will help prepare you so that you can have the margin and the room to invest eternally. That is my challenge for all of us, okay? Let me pray. God, thank you so much for your love for us. I thank you, Lord God, for the blessing of money the wonderful things and experiences that we're able to enjoy and that we can thank you and praise you for. God, thank you for those things. But God, we live in a world that the message all around us is that's what life is about. It's all about that. But God, you give us those things and, and we can certainly glorify you when we enjoy them and we thank you for them. But Father, the real responsibility to the money you give us is to invest 
eternally in our spiritual growth and helping others among other things. I pray we would be focused about doing that, Lord God, that you'd be glorified and that we would not be enslaved to money. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand again, please? Messiah, forever 
Thank you, guys. You guys can take a seat. A few things to just uh, share with the congregation as we wrap up. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to just give you guys a little bit of update from across the seas. We've received a, a few updates from some of our missionaries, and there's some, some exciting things happening. And this is just, it's just exciting, and you guys have been helping out with this, so you need to know what's going on. We have a, a family, the Marshall family. You'll see their, their uh, picture back there at the wall, but they just sent us a message that they're doing... Um, medical ministry over in North Africa, and recently they were they had 670 people come through with different medical issues, and that gave them an opportunity to share the gospel and show the Jesus film, and through that, 310 people have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Not only that, but they have a plan in place already for discipleship and to plant a church. They're working with the local church there. So this is not just going to be a, okay, you accepted Jesus, now go about your life. They're involved in that. And then many of you know Casey Larson. Uh, she spoke here not too long ago when she's from this congregation. She sent us a message saying that they had six recent baptisms within their ministry over in Monmouth University, and three of them who are freshmen. And they're very excited about that. They recently came back from a, uh, a conference and have a lot of people who are getting really excited. So her ministry is really thriving as well. So thank you guys for supporting our missions and, um, and for praying for them. Let's continue to pray for them because God's doing great work there. A few announcements, um, just to really just to remind you guys about Easter's coming up. So Good Friday, we're going to be here at 6 o'clock. That's going to be our Good Friday service. Saturday, we have our um, the Egg Dash and fun Easter activities at uh, starting at 10 o'clock. And then we have a Saturday service at 4 p.m. And then Easter, we have our regular services, guys. So it's just the three standard services. And Hey, we, we just want to take some time and just pray for our Easter services, praying that God is going to bring people here and also that we will have space for everybody. So will you pray with me, particularly as we get ready for Easter? Father God, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for giving us this church. We thank you that you are the head of our church. And as being our head, Lord, you are good to us. You make every decision that is right and good, and we can trust in you to give us guidance. So we pray for your guidance. We pray for your work and your will to be done in our Easter services, Lord God. May this be a place, Lord God, that is a beacon of light and hope to the lost out in the world and that they would come here to know you. We pray that you would fill every chair, but we pray that we would also have space for every person who is coming and visiting, and that those who come and visit, Lord, it wouldn't just be a one-off, and they're not coming again until next Easter, but they would hear from you, and they would be cut by you so that they, Lord God, can give their lives to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. We have our prayer team up here if you need prayer, and um, let's go and serve the Lord today. We are dismissed.